We are in for a, a great treat tonight. Uh, this is actually the second year of a series based on a collaboration between AAAS and the Dana Foundation on Neuroscience and Society. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about neuroscience and the law. Um, as I said, this is a series, future topics that are scheduled in this calendar year, the adolescent brain, human enhancement, and the brain and the arts. Uh, so if you actually signed up for this, we'll send you notification of when the next uh, sessions in the series will occur. I, I do want to acknowledge the partnership we've had with the Dana Foundation, who of course is tremendously interested in issues of neuroscience and society. They have developed a partnership with us on a series of congressional briefings on neuroscience and society issues that's been extremely productive and amazingly well attended. It frequently is the case that we are overwhelmed by congressional staff. I wonder why they're all worrying about their brains so much. Um, tonight's event has a couple of additional sponsors, uh, and they include the International Neuroethics Society and the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience. I should mention that uh, our session is being recorded uh, and a video is being prepared and it'll be posted on the Dana Foundation website a few days from now. Uh, I don't wanna take too much time, but the format that we're gonna to use tonight is first we're gonna hear from Steve Hyman uh, who will give sort of the introductory talk, and then depending on how well behaved he is and how close he is to the time that we gave him, we may have a couple of minutes for questions after his talk, but they'll be short, and let me right now help you define the concept of question. So a question is one of those things where your voice goes up at the end. It's short, it doesn't have a preamble, and, and if you remember, you know, you're the questioner and that the person is the answerer. Um, and then after that, we're really fortunate to have two additional speakers, Owen Jones, who is um, from Vanderbilt University, and I'll reintroduce everybody, and the Honorable Barbara Rothstein, who is a judge. And so fundamentally, we're going to talk about what neuroscience can tell us from the neuroscientist's point of view, and then how it might be used from the legal point of view. And so it should be very interesting. The format will be Dr. Hyman will speak, Mr. Jones, uh, Judge Rothstein, and then we're going to put them up here and we'll have a little discussion amongst themselves, and then we'll open up the floor to those very brief questions that I made reference to. Um, and with that, you have their bios in the program, and so I won't go through them in detail, but let's start with Dr. Stephen Hyman, who is the director of the um, Stanley Center at the Broad Institute. He's also a professor at Harvard, former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, president of the International Neuroethics Society, and a whole bunch of other good stuff. And with that, Dr. Hyman. So thank you very much, Alan, and uh, thank you uh, to all of the sponsors, uh, to the AAAS and the Dana for their long-term commitment to this very important set of uh, dialogues between science and society, and I think especially uh, the nexus between uh, neuroscience and the law, which is just of progressive and increasing uh, both complexity and interest. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, the MacArthur Network uh, and uh, the International Neuroethics Society and remind everybody, if you didn't see them, there's, there's literature, I think, from, uh, from the society at the back table. So um, let me start. You can already see by my t t the way I've titled this talk uh, about 
basically the, tr the problems of attributing causality, it's really at this stage of science, I think it's really important for me to describe my own intellectual biases before, uh, before I start this talk. Um, so I am a brute materialist, arch reductionist scientist who is trying to understand the genetic underpinnings of schizophrenia and autism and bipolar disorder. Um, genes are very important determinants of many mental disorders. They are not fate, we know that. They interact with uh, bad luck and environment and all kinds of other things, but they're very important. Uh, and what we want to understand from this are the biological pathways. At the same time, that intellectual engagement reminds me every day of the incredible complexity and of the need for humility. And in this talk, I'm going to speak about, in some ways, the dialectic between what we're learning in neurogenetics and with brain studies and brain imaging, uh, but always trying to bring us back to what we know now that we can apply potentially in life, in society, uh, and in the courtroom. So uh, in some ways, uh, these discussions should always uh, harken back to uh, uh, theories of moral responsibility, and uh, they're probably older than Aristotle, but Aristotle and Nicomachean ethics uh, discussed the issue of moral responsibility, that is somebody being uh, in desert of either praise or blame, and with blame in legal systems now can come punishment, and uh, what Aristotle said is that a person, in order to be morally responsible, must act freely uh, and uh, can't be ignorant of the basic consequences of, of what they are doing. And uh, free, f acting freely, of course, means that you're not being coerced, but also I, I don't think Aristotle was quite thinking of the scientific uh, webs of causality uh, with which we are now all struggling. So let me just say one other introductory remark. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in uncaused causes. Uh, I think, uh, f you know, free will uh, is, however, is a metaphysical issue that we could get lost in for uh, many hours here, and it's not really that pragmatic. And so in discussing um, what we mean by acting freely, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to stay with this sort of ordinary practical reasoning aspect of, you know, are there uh, profound proximate causes in our genes, in our brains as a result of illness or injury that constrain our ability to uh, understand what we're doing, understand right and from wrong, and control our behavior. Okay, so um, we, of course, we have a judge on the program, so I'll be very uh, uh, fast here, but, but what's important, uh, and, and, and it, it just, in, in any introductory talk, it's really critical that to be, almost congruently with Aristotle, uh, to be guilty, you have to have a, 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 a the criminal mind, mens rea, the, uh, the, the ability to form a criminal intent, and what's, uh, as, as I've uh, begun to, if, as I've gone to a lot of these kinds of seminars, I, I recognize that the law is, is fairly subtle about this. That is, the mind, your, your actual mindset going into committing a criminal act matters a great deal. If you're cold and calculating and pur purposeful when you commit a murder, well, that's murder, and I won't go through the degrees and so forth. I'll certainly get them wrong. If you're simply being reckless, that's manslaughter. If you're being negligent, it, it, it is a lesser crime. So this mindset really matters. Here's the problem, and this is one of the reasons why um, neuroscience and the law have become so salient. We don't have access to people's mental states. And people lie all the time. And, and sometimes, of course, intentionally and, uh, and coldly and with purpose, but often they lie to themselves. Uh, in, indeed, as if, even in ordinary life, as we explain, you know, what were my motives for becoming interested in this topic? I could tell you a very compelling story, uh, but uh, would it be veridical? Uh, were these really the causal influences? Almost certainly not. And there's a lot of cognitive neuroscience that tells us that we're always um, updating our memories and our interpretations of things in general, 
uh, to be aligned uh, in, in our favor, uh, although there are a minority of people with a depressive uh, uh, sentiment who might, uh, might do the opposite. And, and because mental state matters so much, we're looking for objective predictors and objective markers. And in thinking about the nervous system, there have been two major areas that have become um, very salient, and one is neurogenetics, that is the genes that uh, help build the nervous system and that some people have associated with either criminal or other unwanted behaviors, uh, and then brain structure and function, which, which I will come back to. So, um, just want to see if, yeah, here's the lady. So this is, uh, this is from, an I, this is an IVF embryo, pre-implantation, uh, wondering, you know, what it's going to be when it grows up. Uh, and it says, you know, well, if I do anything violent, don't, it's not me, it's, I'm just a tool of my DNA. And uh, in fact, um, you know, there's a story behind several genes, but one, oops, one is a gene for something called monoamine oxidase. Well, monoamine oxidase um, is, 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 is an enzyme, it's a protein that breaks down certain neurotransmitters in our bodies, in our brains. Uh, neurotransmitters that many of you have probably heard of, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that is increased in neural connections by a lot of antidepressants, for example. And initially, um, there was a Dutch family that was, that was identified where uh, some of the offspring, so some of the boys had uh, a, a big piece of, uh, of DNA missing. And part of what was missing was uh, on this piece of DNA was this gene. Now, as is typical of people missing big chunks of DNA, um, th th these boys were intellectually disabled. Uh, the older term would have been mental retardation. Um, but they were also extremely violent. And uh, generally, one should be very circumspect about interpreting what violence means uh, when somebody is also intellectually disabled and has other uh, things wrong with their brain. But uh, the research community got uh, uh, fascinated by this, and they found that uh, in people who weren't missing a big chunk of DNA but just had little tiny mutations uh, in this gene, there were two flavors of the gene, and by research, which looked at people who were violent and people who weren't violent, it's very hard to define violence and come up with a homogeneous group, by the way, but they asked which flavor of the gene did they have, and there's a low activity form, which by consensus in, in some parts of the research community uh, is associated with violence. And that's this kind of gene for theory. You know, this is a gene for violence, a gene for grumpiness, a gene for schizophrenia, and so forth. The trouble, and, and, and by the way, this matters because in several courts, there's a case in Italy where somebody with the risky version, the risky flavor of this gene, had his sentence reduced. Um, and it wasn't even so simple. There's another story that says this gene might not do something by itself, but if you've had an adverse uh, childhood and you're in, a, in a, an arousing uh, context, then you may have a higher risk of violence. So his sentence was reduced. The prosecutors appealed, and a second Italian court reduced his sentence by another year. Here's the problem. So that is what I would... That, that, you know, that's sort of a, a, a just-so story. We, we, um, we all learned uh, in uh, high school biology about Gregor Mendel and his peas. Re remember, he was the Austrian monk who was the father of genetics, and he looked at traits uh, that where a single gene decided whether a pea was round or wrinkled, <coughs> I'm kind of getting wrinkled, uh, whether the, the pea was yellow or green, whether the flower was purple or white. What he probably actually did is he ignored all the traits he couldn't understand, and he found, uh, he reported, he was clever enough only to report on the simple ones. The problem is that our brains, we are not like Mendel's peas, 
And so uh, when we look for genes for autism or schizophrenia, what we find is that for schizophrenia, we're up to, with, with great certainty, because in order, when things are complicated, you need uh, very large populations so that the signal to noise, you, 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 can, you can tell the signal and not the noise. We're up to 90 genes, each of which contribute just a little increment of risk. And there's reason to think that for, for these uh, very severe uh, mental disorders, that there'll be many hundreds of genes that make, each make small contributions. And we could probably try to associate any one of these and say, you know, this is a gene for schizophrenia. Uh, but, but that's really not nearly true because the, the, there, there's a lot going on biologically between our genes and our behavior. Uh, the genes are read out in development. Many, many genes, maybe much of our genome, work together to build the brain. Um, this is not a deterministic process. We have 100 trillion synapses in our brains. There is not enough information in the genome to wire them up deterministically, so there's just a certain amount of luck in how things wire up. There's also genetic direction that they're interacting. And then there's the whole world of chemical exposures, lived experience, and ultimately, you know, for complex ordinary behaviors like violence, however you might even define that, um, one gene might make a tiny contribution. So what the, what the appeals court in Italy should have been asking is, you know, um, how many people commit violent crimes who don't have that flavor of that gene, right? And what is the effect size in populations of having that flavor of the gene? Most of the genes that we know of for autism, for schizophrenia, for other behaviors, each one of these might increase the risk by 1.1 fold, which means that if there's a population risk of schizophrenia and you have a gene that increases risk by 1.1 fold, your risk is literally 1.1% instead of 1%. But of course, they, they, they eventually add up. Um, and so, um, in some sense, a lot of this early genetics done with small, poorly selected populations tells a very misleading story. Here, here's a very concrete example. These are two identical twins. One has schizophrenia and one doesn't. Okay, so if you have an identical twin, you share 100% of your DNA, um, and the risk of schizophrenia, I've already told you, just a second ago in the population is 1%, but if you have an identical twin, your risk is 50%. That's an enormous increase, right? Because you share all of the risk genes but your likelihood of not having schizophrenia is also 50%. Now, the truth is that brother uh, with schizophrenia here, you can see that he has uh, increased uh, uh, fluid-filled spaces, ventricles in his brain, and the brother who is unaffected has nice, narrow, normal ventricles. This brother has schizophrenia because he has cognitive abnormalities and, and hallucinations and delusions. Probably if we really tested this brother cognitively, we would find a few peculiarities, probably not perfectly healthy, but he doesn't have the disease. And this reminds us, even for a highly genetic condition, even when these two people, if say in this family there are 100 genes that conspire to cause risk, they both have all of the genes, luck, environment, brain development has given this person this terribly disabling disorder and this one not. The other thing that we find uh, in doing the genetics, uh, which also I think bears on this issue of whether a there is a gene for violence, a gene for criminality, a gene for uh, psychopathy, is that, um, is, is that the, more, uh, the more severe the condition, the, the fewer genes you need involved. So, so people who are born with syndromal, you know, with mental retardation and epilepsy and facial dysmorphology very well likely have a, a single very severe mutation that is causing that. But as you get toward, you know, and, and autism has onset age two or three and it looks 
please don't hold me to this. I, 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 in fact, you'll probably forget it because it's probably quite boring, but, but um, it looks like you know, autism, the, the genetic mutations are sort of less harmful to the proteins that the genes are making than they are for these very severe you know, cases of intellectual disability. In schizophrenia, people make it to age 15 or 18, and, and we're not seeing so many you know, totally you know, damaging mutations. So if somebody is an otherwise perfectly healthy person but has a terrible temper, you know, we're not likely to see a single mutation, a single gene, a gene for criminality, a gene for violence. Importantly, it doesn't mean that genes are unimportant. It just means that we haven't done the research with a scope and scale to, to recognize all of the complex risk factors. And then, even then, when we have the whole story, because you saw those two brothers with schizophrenia, it remains only part of the story, right? Uh, at, for behavior, except in the most severe cases, genes don't act deterministically. So that's, that's really that part of the story. But I would remind you, even for famous genes that cause cancer, now most cancer actually is a genetic disease where the mutations are, form after birth because you've hammered your cells with cigarette smoke or something else. But even the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which were thought to be fate if you had this mutation, well, it turns out that in these genes, there are a thousand different mutations, and depending what other genes you have, uh, it, it, it changes what, whether or not you get cancer, or when you get cancer, or if you get cancer. And we're only beginning to understand even these very potent mutations for cancer, let alone for complex behaviors, with, with you know, again, big data looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So this is just an article about this from uh, my favorite journal, the Journal of the New York Times last week. <laughs> so now there are findings, right, that correlate the, going back to the MAO story, you know, this risky allele, the low activity allele, with, with brain activity. And, um, you know, there's no reason to believe that the, the, this research hasn't been carefully done. Um, uh, but what you see is there's a part of the, the a brain called um, the uh, prefrontal cortex, which um, you'll see in a second. You, you can't have a program like this without showing a picture of Phineas Gage, and you'll meet him in a second. But the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that, uh, among many other things, holds goals online, contains your values, and above all, inhibits you know, your impulses and inhibits your responding to distractions. And part of this uh, uh, prefrontal cortex is something called the anterior cingulate gyrus, and all of these things have lots of functions. Sometimes we talk about them as if we were phrenologists, but the uh, anterior cingulate gyrus detects conflicts. You know, I was planning to do my homework, but I found myself, you know, at the bar. Um, and, you know, detects these kinds of conflicts, uh, determines whether you're on course, whether you're impulsive, and people with the risky flavor of this MAO gene, which I've already just trashed to you in some sense, or said the case has been made so much more strongly than it deserves, uh, uh, but yet here, you know, it correlates with um, uh, the, 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 the people with the protective flavor, the high activity flavor, have more activity in their anterior cingulate than people with the risky flavor. So that would say, well, uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, but I'll come back to this in a second. And now a paper just came out last month in the Proceedings of the National Academy uh, in which uh, a, a, a pretty good group of scientists were scanning um, prisoners in New Mexico and trying to predict who would be rearrested after release. And what they found was a population difference um, between um, activity in the anterior cingulate. So these are, these, I mean, these are the pictures. But basically, people who, who, given a task where they have to inhibit themselves, so the task, very quickly, is you're supposed to hit a button every time the letter X appears. But every so often, the letter O appears before the X. And if O appears, you've got to inhibit that response. And 
people who are bad at that, it's a predictor of impulsivity and their anterior cingulate is less active. And this group found that the anterior cingulate was, uh, the, the more activity in your anterior cingulate, the less you would be, um, likely you would be rearrested. So here's Phineas Gage, right? So Phineas uh, was a 19th century railway foreman who uh, was supposed to uh, uh, tamp down gunpowder covered with sand wh while his uh, railway company was blasting in Vermont. And at one point, somebody forgot to put on the sand, and he was not attentive. And he hit the rock, and there was a spark, and the gunpowder went off, and his tamping bar uh, blew through his brain, and shockingly, he lived. Um, and, but he became impulsive, profane, unpredictable, and it was, he became sort of a celebrity because uh, it, it sort of, it looked like the brain was involved in the moral sense and in planning and so forth. And uh, his skull and his tamping bar are sitting on a shelf at uh, the library at Harvard Medical School. You can visit it, um, open to the public. Um, but here, here's, here again is the, the, the issue. Um, this is a correlation. In Phineas, nature and carelessness conspired to do an experiment. We knew what Phineas was like as an individual before. Then he had this terrible accident, and then he became sort of antisocial after this terrible accident. Here we have these groups, and, you know, in a very artificial circumstance, you know, doing this task on a computer. And sure, people who are more impulsive, lots of things that they do worse in school, uh, they probably commit more low-skill crimes because they don't inhibit themselves. We know they're, they're, they have, they're riskier in terms of drug abuse, but they have lots and lots and lots of other qualities as well, which are not being measured here. And this is a population study. What does this say about any individual? Um, so with Phineas Gage, so this is, the, this is the problem. You know, I believe ultimately that our behavior is the production of activity in our brain circuits. But I would, you know, I would never tell a parole board to decide whether to release somebody or hold on to somebody based on their, you know, a, a brain scan and a, as an individual, because I can't tell what are the causal factors in, in that individual. Um, uh, whereas in poor old Phineas here, I know the causal factors. Now here's the problem with all of this research that has been hanging around implicitly um, through my whole talk. We cannot ethically and pragmatically do experiments on the human brain to understand causality, right? <coughs> ethically and pragmatically, we do experiments on rodents, but rodents have a pretty sorry version of a prefrontal cortex. It works for them. They, they do fine, but it's very, evolutionarily very different from ours. It's challenging to do ex, uh, experiments on monkeys. Some are done, but e e even there, the, you know, the, besides different haircuts and arm length, a big difference between humans and chimpanzees is actually our prefrontal cortex. There's a lot of evolutionary non-conservation. And so we, in, in some sense, in, the, in, in our exuberance someti sometimes to uh, to say, look, we, we're beginning to understand self-control in the brain. And, every, and it started with Phineas Gage, but now you know, we can see it with these wonderful scanners. We should never forget that these are correlations, they're not causes, that we're looking at isolated single factors, not at all of the factors. In some sense, the lesson is just like the genes, which is, if I look at one small gene in isolation, I can probably you know, find some correlation, but but I shouldn't, we're not at a stage where we can either excuse or convict based on this sort of, or, or determine a sentence more likely, because I don't think people are doing this in the guilt phase. It's getting late, so I, I, I'll, let me just uh, go to the conclusion, because there, you may want to have some questions or rebuttal or what have you. Um, so what can we conclude? Look. Genotypes matter. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, this is what I work on, right? And the brain, of course, undergirds, unless you're a mystic or a Cartesian dualist, 
It undergirds all of our thought, our emotion, our behavior. And of course, it, it goes both ways, right? What our lived experience also changes our brains, right? It's not some uh, bottom-up biological determinism. Um, but a genotype at a single locus, that is a single gene, from everything we know so far, is so unlikely to have a large effect on behavior that I do wonder really about the methodology of the research. I'll talk about that in a second. And then now the latest craze is to talk about G by E. Say, well, it's not that complicated. It's genes and environment. So if you have the bad flavor of the MAO gene and you've been abused as a child uh, and, and you're stimulated in a certain way, then the bad thing happens. Uh-uh, this is still, um, this, I, I think, I don't think there are main effects. I think there are just really complex interactive effects. And uh, I think we're gonna understand a lot more, but it's really early days. I'm really worried about these poor designs. The, the, you know, when genes contribute these incremental small effects, because lots and lots of genes are building the brain and little things go wrong and create all the wonderful different variety of human beings, which in some contexts can create trouble, um, when you have a, a study, uh, you know, so the, 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 the study I showed you of the MAO gene and the brain scans had, you know, maybe 120 people in it, and that was said to be a big number. Um, probably tens of thousands of people are needed to get the signal to noise right because of, again, this is one gene interacting with other genes, 20,000 other genes with different flavors and different experience. So um, I think... Basically, um, uh, and since Alan published, I know he doesn't edit science, he publishes science, um, you know, these low-end studies are, are a problem. Often they're shifting hypotheses, right? So, it, because novelty in science, um, you know, you don't want to just say this gene associates with violence of one, people keep, never, never really test the same thing again. Um, and, <coughs> And then also people publish their positive results, not their negative results. So I think this publication bias. So in the end, um, I think neuroscience, um, there, 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 there are clearly clinical scans which, which will have an import for sentencing and so forth. But, but w I think there's a risk that we're already seeing of people overinterpreting early results, and uh, which doesn't mean, which doesn't mean we, we should reject neuroscience and genetics. It's just that we're in a hurry. These are the hardest problems we face, and there's a lot more to be learned. Thank you. Let's take uh, two questions, one at each microphone. How's that? Don't all rush. So I, I'll ask. All right. Thank you. You know how fragile I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You ready? Yeah. So since you said you're a reductionist. Yes. And you don't have a separate mind and body. Yes. So isn't it inevitable that your brain made you do it? Yes, but I am my brain. So if my brain made me do it, I did it. <laughs> it's just that we don't right now uh, the problem is, if you say this spot on my brain scan made, made me do it, that, that's, that's the fallacy, right? Right. But ultimately, ultimately, can't you blame your brain? Um, but if you're, if you're blaming your brain, you might as well be looking in the mirror. And everybody uh, yeah, has yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I am looking in yeah, the yeah, mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Go yeah. ahead, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Lisa Kundas. I'm with the NIMH. I was wondering if you, um, this was a great presentation, uh, but I was wondering if you could speak maybe to the differences in methodologies. Like we talk about um, certain brain scans, but there's different sequences that people use and generalizing yeah, yes, across yeah. that. Maybe? Okay, so this is technical, but it's, it's worth, so in genetics, genetics is pretty simple. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a string of letters. And we can all put our data together in the end. Um, brain imaging is very, very challenging. People use, fortunately, there are only two major dominant brands, GE and Siemens, but people collect their data differently. They have a smart graduate student who's come up with some 
algorithm. They use uh, different corrections for the noise. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why, there are two reasons, many reasons, but two main reasons why we don't reach the kinds of large numbers in brain scanning studies that you would probably need to, to, to really understand some of these things better. One is the cost per person, and because th this is time usually taken away from clinical uses. Uh, and the second is these very, the, the varying methodologies make it challenging to, to put the data together. But I also think there are clearly issues of design, of publication bias, which tends to bring to the light of day positive correlations and, and hide um, negative, because nobody wants to see, we did, this, uh, we did this study and we didn't find a spot that caused uh, people to rob stores and, you know, and so that goes unpublished. Okay. Want to try one more? We'll turn no, they're all um, in semi coma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, they're worried about their brains. Yes. Go ahead, quickly. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Bob Russell from the National Science Foundation. I wonder if you could comment, you know, in a vaguely similar way. You know, we, we are diagnosing all kinds of kids as being hyperactive or yes, whatever yeah. based on their yeah. brain, and then we're saying, yeah. and that causes problems in reading or what have you. Uh, could you just comment on that? Sure. So it, this is very, very vexed. You know, um, I would love to have the answers to this, but like all of you, I was born too soon to have the answers. So very quickly, um, ADHD, which by the way is a risk factor for drug use and impulsive behavior, all, all kinds of things, um, is mis like, like all mental disorders is mis classified, misunderstood in the DSM, in the official nomenclature, because the DSM takes everything as a category, discontinuous with normal, so you either have ADHD or not. Um, and that's partly because the people in the 60s and 70s who came up with the diagnostic system uh, wanted to separate from psychoanalysts and wanted real diseases, and so it's like smallpox, you know, you have it or you don't have it. Actually, ADHD, like most neuropsychiatric disorders are continuous with normal, and kids with ADHD are in the left tail of a bell curve. And by the way, those kids, untreated, have terrible life outcomes, right? But then there's sort of a gray zone. And what we haven't been able to do in psychiatry, because we don't have ob objective measures, is, is what people have done with blood. We all have a blood pressure, but you know we can measure it objectively, and then we look at how many people have heart attacks or strokes 20 years later, and we can decide what the cutoff is for insurance paying for you to get medicine, right? And in ADHD, we haven't done that. So the first mistake is it's, cat it, we, we, it's like a category discontinuous with normal, just not true. And second of all, we haven't therefore done the empirical research to find cutoffs for treatment, even though the zone will be gray. This, this, this makes it very difficult to do imaging research because you enter people with DSM criteria, and the DSM criteria, you know, they're not awful, but they're kind of fictive. Um, so that has impeded progress. Um, I think people are learning, I mean, people are, are starting to figure this out. I think we will make progress. Unfortunately, we, we don't have all, we, this, is, this is the essence of my talk. I mean, neuroscience is real, we're gonna we'll get there over time, but we, we shouldn't hype what isn't ready for prime time yet. And a second thing, DSM is one of the, and, and some of the rodent models are ways in which we have gotten in our own way by credulously holding on to things that are palpably failing us scientifically. We may come back to that. Okay. Um, good. That's a good start. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> good. Let, let's turn to Owen Jones. He's the New York Alumni Chancellor's Chair in Law, Professor of Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt, and the Director of the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience. Owen? Okay, there we are. Uh, so thank you, Alan. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the promise and the perils of trying to use neuroscience in uh, legal contexts. Um, you're probably here because you've noticed, uh, as I have, that suddenly brains are everywhere. They're in the news, 
Uh, they're in advertising, some of my personal favorites here. Uh, they're also increasingly in art. Uh, what you may be less aware of is the extent to which neuroscience has spawned a whole series of subdisciplines, including uh, neuropolitics, neuromarketing, neurohistory, and neuroeconomics. And one of the fields that we're uh, here today to discuss, what the New York Times and others have called uh, neuro law. There's been a real surge in interest in law and neuroscience, and it's traceable in a variety of ways. Uh, this is a chart of the uh, cumulative law and neuroscience publications, both conceptual and empirical, which I think uh, pretty clearly demonstrates that by 2050, every man, woman, and child in America will be writing articles in law and neuroscience. Um, it's also uh, traceable in the sharp increase in neuroscientific evidence being offered in court. And it's important to note that this is true both in civil cases and in criminal cases. I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on criminal because they're both vivid and illustrative, but it's important to recognize that there are a lot of civil cases, and not just the ones that might come first to mind, like medical malpractice uh, for, for, or torts for brain injuries, but also uh, claims for disability benefits. Uh, people who don't have actual uh, uh, nails in their head may still have damage to their brain function that enables them to support a claim for disability benefits that have otherwise been denied. Uh, and of course there are issues of, of competence as one ages uh, into, uh, into, in some cases, Alzheimer's. Uh, somewhere along the line there are competence determinations and these sorts of things. And people try, lawyers try, to bring neuroscientific evidence to bolster and buttress uh, their, their cases. Um, so in my, in my few minutes, what I want to do is uh, touch very briefly on a few key things. Why is this interest all surging? Uh, how's that working out for the courts? What might we do about all this? And then I'll end with a few remarks about the, uh, the extent of neural law research and some resources for those of you who may be interested in learning uh, more outside this panel. So the surging interest, I think, is quite simple. For many lawyers, the equation is this. Uh, you take perennial legal questions, the kinds of things we grapple with all the time, you add in some new neurotechnological capabilities and out of this admixture springs hope. Okay, so, uh, so the kinds of questions that I think the legal system hopes that neuroscience can help with are the kinds of things we grapple with all the time. And as uh, uh, Steve mentioned, um, we don't have direct access to mental states, and yet mental states are so critical to so much of what law does. We're interested in questions like, and we're constantly grappling with, is this person responsible for his behavior? What capacity did this person have to act differently? How competent is this person? Of course, as Steve mentioned, is this person lying? This is a huge issue in the legal system if we could solve that, or even solve a piece of it. What does this person remember? How accurate is their memory? All these sorts of things depend on making some assessment of what's going on in a person's brain, and we can't access that directly. But we have lots of technologies <clears throat> that enable us to hope that maybe uh, we can illuminate these processes in some way. Uh, and that hope, and I pitched down the middle on this, is for better or for worse. It may help us in some cases, and in others it may lead us astray. But the hope enables us to dream that when confronted with some kinds of cases, we might get a neurological handle. This is an admittedly extreme uh, example, but it makes the point. Um, this is a fellow who tried unsuccessfully to commit suicide by crossbow. He had been depressed and antisocial. Uh, now his doctors describe him, this is the, the technical term, as inappropriately cheerful. He's just <laughs> happy all the time, but he's not apparently insane. Now the question is, suppose this fellow, this is contrary to fact, but suppose this fellow robs a bank or rapes someone or simply executes a contract which he later hopes he can be excused from performing. Okay, and we learn that he has this arrow embedded in his forehead. I love, by the way, that the journal inserted these little teensy arrows uh, just in case you somehow missed the big arrows. So he does, he does this at-home prefrontal lobotomy, and he's not rowing with all his oars in the water. 
obviously, but does that excuse him? If it doesn't excuse him, what might we do with him as a matter of sentencing? Do we increase his sentence or do we decrease his sentence or do we simply ignore the fact that he's not using the same kind of tissue that you or I might be using? Okay, so that is by way of background some of the surge in interest. Uh, and how's that working out? I'm gonna talk very briefly about three cases. Uh, this is one uh, ripped from the headlines just two months ago. This is Maureen O'Connor, she's the former mayor of San Diego. Around 2000, she started gambling a lot. She wagered over the next nine years, she wagered over a billion dollars. And she lost, actually this is pretty remarkable it seems to me, I would have done worse. She lost only net about 13 million. Uh, but she had to come up with that money. So one of the places she came up with it was raiding a charity of $2 million for which she was uh, accused and, and arrested. What's interesting is that uh, about three quarters of the way through this binge, a tumor was discovered here in two different, uh, two different sections, and uh, it was removed. And she's using that through her lawyer as some kind of defense to her run-of-the-mill culpability that I might have if I wagered a billion dollars and stole a couple million dollars. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But the complexity that Steve was referring to is here in spades because I showed this to my class in law and neuroscience. Now these are lawyers in training and they immediately, I'm glad to say, could recognize that these tumors, this tumor from two different angles, is not in what we classically think of as the decision-making area of the brain. Okay, so on the one hand you think, aha, gotcha, you're faking. On the other hand, the cranium is a zero-sum space. So you have a tumor growing in one region, it's pushing, cramping, impinging on other areas of the brain tissue in ways that we don't really understand. So what do we do with that kind of information? What are judges to do? What are lawyers to do? Uh, it remains to be seen how that will play out. But let me give you a couple other cases in which neuroscience uh, was highly relevant. Um, uh, this is a case in which uh, this uh, fellow at the top uh, sadly, uh, killed his now uh, former wife, stabbing her 61 times. He was quickly convicted of the murder, but at the sentencing hearing, because he was uh, death penalty eligible, a jury, as opposed to a judge, which is the more tr traditional sentencing route, a jury has to decide whether he should be killed or instead serve the rest of his life uh, in prison. And at the sentencing hearing, uh, the judge admitted uh, evidence by this neuroscientist, Dr. Robert Thacker. Um, uh, this is just an illustration of the kinds of evidence he does. It's called QEEG, quantitative electroencephalography. These are stylized heads that you're looking down onto the top of, colorized uh, in a way somewhat rep reminiscent of uh, fMRI, and uh, purporting to detect variations in electrical activity uh, unique to Grady Nelson that arguably should entitle him to life in prison instead of execution. Now what's interesting about this case is that in Florida, a majority of the jurors, seven, would have to vote for execution. Only six did. So his life was literally hanging in the balance. Two of the jurors came out afterwards and said they were leaning towards execution, but this neuroscientific evidence turned them around. Here's a quotation from one of the jurors. We don't usually get such a direct statement. It turned my decision all the way around. The technology really swayed me. After seeing the brain scans, I was convinced this guy had some sort of brain problem. Okay, now, I don't know whether or not the QEG evidence was so slam dunk that some reasonable inference about a serious problem uh, could be made. But I do know that even people with serious problems don't necessarily stab their wives 61 times. So again, the question is, how do we go about assessing the relevance of this information and what we should do with it once we have it? Okay, third case. This is uh, U.S. versus uh, Lauren Semrau. Um, Semrau, uh, here on the left, was uh, accused of uh, Medicare and Medicaid fraud. His attorney, Houston Gordon, hired this fellow neuroscientist, Steve Lakin, who offers fMRI technology for lie detection, or as the defense called it, truth verification purposes. Um, now, what's interesting here is that after putting uh, Dr. Semero in the scanner, we came up with a report. This is the direct quote. Dr. Semero's brain indicates he is telling the truth in regards to not cheating or defrauding the government. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but are we going to let this evidence even reach the jury for the jury to decide?
Ultimately, the judge, and I think quite properly on the facts of this case, decided that this evidence was not admissible, not because categorically it's inappropriate, but because this particular experiment with this individual on the nature of the stimuli and the nature of the, uh, the protocols was not suitable for reaching the jury. I think that was the right decision, but this is illustrative of the kinds of cases where lawyers are trying to use that hope to serve their clients uh, in a zealous way. Okay, a few more remarks then. Uh, what to do about it? There has to be a serious effort by lawyers and uh, by judges as well to separate the wheat from the chaff. It is really important to focus not necessarily just on medical relevance. Is there a tumor? Where is it in the brain? What part of the brain uh, is it affecting and with what probable consequences? But to connect that condition through some chain of legitimate inferences to the, um, the, the context that is legally relevant. And that means uh, taking uh, attention to the limitations of some of these technologies. I'll mention just a couple of these, and this overlaps a little bit with some of the things that Steve mentioned. First, you've got a base rate problem. This is Herbert Weinstein's brain, excuse me. Uh, you might notice uh, a subarachnoid cyst there on the right. You might not call it that, but you can see that something appears to be out of the ordinary on this PET scan. We have no idea. He threw his wife out a 12-story uh, window trying to make it look like suicide, allegedly. Uh, we have no idea how many people are walking around with this condition who don't th throw their wives out the window. Uh, causation here cannot be assumed. Even if it impinges on uh, brain activity in a meaningful way, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is why he threw his wife out the window. Uh, in addition, today's brain is not yesterday's brain. If you scanned a whole bunch of people who had been on death row for 20 years and they all had a brain abnormality, you wouldn't necessarily have any meaningful way of knowing whether or not this traced uh, back to the time of crime. Uh, it may be that the causal arrow runs in the opposite direction, that being on death row is a brain intervention and it's bad for your brain, perhaps. Okay, a couple last things to mention before turning to resources and then turning it over. Uh, the challenges of group average data. This is from the same study that Steve mentioned, uh, and he highlighted an issue that I think is absolutely critical, that is the courts and lawyers need to distinguish between when data is drawn from a particular individual before the court and when inferences are, uh, are uh, pushed on the court by lawyers uh, uh, focusing on group average data. It is very difficult to make that move. Not necessarily always impossible, not that it might not be probative, probative under some circumstances, but you do not want to make that move uh, casually or lightly. Um, fMRI as uh, one of the uh, main technologies du jour uh, is a really powerful technique. It can tell you an awful lot of things, but it is really critical that jurors and lawyers and judges understand that this is not a heat map. It is not as if somehow you're detecting the place in the brain where the activity is. Often these are sub the results of uh, subtraction techniques where you're seeing statistic representations of statistical differences in activity between two different conditions. Those colors are selected by people, they're thresholded by people, and uh, it's not meaningfully like an x-ray with a crossbow bolt uh, in your forehead. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that even when the evidence is relevant, it can still be excluded. It can be excluded because judges uh, typically, here in, under the Federal Rule of Evidence 403 and under state court analogs, have the option to say, even though this is relevant, it could be too prejudicial for the jury. Maybe they're too likely to be swayed by what some people have called the Christmas tree effect maybe they'll be too gullible. Interestingly, there are uh, very nice studies that cut in opposite directions on this, and I think um, uh, definitive work uh, still needs to be done. Last thing I'll say um, is just about where you might wanna go if you want to learn more about this area of law. Uh, one is the Research Network on Law and Neuroscience, which I have the honor to direct, and which both uh, Judge Roth Rothstein and uh, Dr. Hyman were instrumental in um, in, in launching an earlier iteration of this kind of work. Uh, we um, uh, try to do what we can to um, 
uh, help separate wheat and chaff, to spread the word about what sort of research is going on, and also to engage in research ourselves. This is a, a, an overview of the kinds of things we're engaged in a collaborative way in exploring. We're looking at uh, issues of adolescent development, tying together cognitive psychology and neuroimaging. We have several studies underway with respect to mental states, testing the limits of deception, uh, technology using fMRI, trying to see about uh, ability to recognize whether you are recognizing an image, for example, that you are seeing, uh, trying to learn about how people go about assessing intent in others and deciding punishments and these sorts of things, engaging in the machinery of, uh, of legal decision making. And one of the things we do is we focus uh, a lot, often with partners, on diffusion of, uh, of, of information, uh, training judges, training lawyers, engaging in uh, seminars like these. And one of the things I want to highlight is we have a website that uh, compiles every law and neuroscience article and chapter that we are aware of, often in, in multiple languages. We have links there to others uh, who in their labs are doing important law and neuroscience research as well. And we also publish uh, something called NeuroLaw News, which is uh, free to those who subscribe. You can do that uh, through the website. Um, the last thing I'm going to, to say and leave you with is just uh, this lovely image of the important uh, distinction in cultures between law and neuroscience. And aside from all the other substance of how difficult it is to translate concepts from one uh, field into another, we also have layered onto that a real procedural gap in understanding the lang language which even enables us to make that sort of translation. And so I am really glad to be engaged in the interdisciplinary dialogue here. I'm glad for all my interdisciplinary uh, collaborators, and I think it's both an exciting time and also one in which we have to move with uh, deliberate, uh, deliberate caution as well. So thank you for your attention. I think we'll just go on. I think we'll just go on. That was terrific. Um, so our next speaker, Judge Barbara Rothstein, who's a U.S. District Judge visiting from the Western District of Washington, of which she was the chief judge for many years. She also was director of the Federal Judicial Center here in Washington, and now she's senior judge, U.S. District Court here in D.C. Judge Roth. Well, my position is to tell you a little bit about all of this from the judge's point of view, and uh, believe me, it is a very different point of view. The first thing to keep in mind is that science in the courtroom is totally different than anything you've ever heard. Everybody was showing you pictures, they were showing you graphs with you know, things going up and down and all kinds of studies. Judges don't do science that way. Science comes into the courtroom in the context of a particular case. There's no interest in science as an abstract matter. I can tell you that right off personally and from knowing a lot of judges. The science is introduced in the courtroom to enable one side to win, to triumph over the other in the case. The science is introduced in an adversarial setting. Each side has an expert, and guess what? They pay those experts, okay? So these experts are not like the people who just spoke to you today, giving you a, a sort of impartial view of where the science is at. Their job is to make the judge or the jury believe that their version of the science is true and correct and should win the case. Now, <clears throat> you've heard that it's all this neuroscience is coming into the courtroom or is trying to come into the courtroom. And it's coming in in the context of civil cases where the idea is to convince the jury that an injury was either caused or not caused, depending on which side of the case you're on, by a particular accident or occurrence. And then there's the criminal context where the neurological condition or the condition of the brain is being introduced either to mitigate a sentence or, in fact, to go to the, the real question of guilt or innocence the competence, the responsibility of the person um, in whether he or she committed the crime with which he's charged. Now, 
The background of all of this to remember at all times is that we are committed in this country to having our cases, however complex they are, tried by juries. It's in our Constitution. There was a time when it was about in the 60s when a number of judges tried to carve out an exception and say these cases are too complex for juries to hear, went up to the Supreme Court, down. It, 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 never, it, it, it never caught on, and in fact, most of the issues, patent cases, which are heavily scientific, these cases we're talking about today, they go to juries. Um, <clears throat> and most of us who are in the business um, tend to believe that for most things, juries, jurors are pretty good. Um, they are used to judging credibility. We all judge credibility. You know, it's one thing to say everybody lies. Well, not everybody lies. Some people lie, some people don't. Some people take the oath that they take before they get onto the stand very, very seriously. Some people don't. Jurors are very good at this. Why? Because they do this in their regular lives. All of us know when somebody, we think we know, we hope we know, when somebody's telling us the truth or not. But what we're used to using, what we're used to using as indicia of who to believe and not to believe are the kinds of things like, you know, are they nervous? Does it make sense? I've heard all the other evidence and this is absolutely crazy. This guy has a motive. What we're not used to, what is new in this whole thing, is that somebody's telling us they can tell, they can tell, absolutely tell us, because they're looking at something in our brain. That's new, and that would be a shock to most jurors. Incidentally, I hope you notice, I am not using PowerPoint. Um, I go under the saying that power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so <laughs> I actually have to use notes instead of, instead of slides. Um, what happened, and this is a little history that'll give you some background on how cases are actually decided today. As more and more complex science came into the courtroom, the, in about the 80s, there was a phenomenon known as junk science. Crazy cases were coming down. Why? Because in truth and in fact, when a jury is so shown a curricula vitae by two experts, each curricula vitae going on for three or four pages, and each listing lots of publications and good schools and all of that, they really often can't tell. So what happened in the 80s was there was a case called Daubert versus Dow Chemicals. It was a case in which the plaintiffs were alleging that a particular chemical had a bad effect on women who took that in their early pregnancy and caused birth defects. Turned out there was practically no science prepared by plaintiff's attorneys. What they did was they took some of the studies done by defendant's attorneys and did them over. And in, in point of fact, there was really no science on that side. And the court looked at it and did not allow the case to go to the jury. The court said, no, 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 no. This is bad science. It should not even get to the finder effect. And they decided the case on something called summary judgment. Well, the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court very rarely hears cases involving rules of evidence. There were 24 Friends of the Court briefs filed in the Daubert case. Every scientific organization that was in the country, the reputable science, everyone filed a brief. Why? Because the scientists believed, and I think this is, this is so important, they believed that what was happening with science in the courtroom was contributing to a miscarriage of justice. And it was also contributing to a bad view of science. When you have a jury, and I'm picking the worst case, but it was a case, when you have a jury awarding damages to a plaintiff who is a psychic and alleges that she lost her psychic powers by going through a magnetometer at the airport, and the jury gives her damages for that, for future loss of, this was her income, this was her profession, and they gave her damages for that, <clears throat> that's a reason to be really worried about what kind of science is coming into the courtroom. <clears throat> 
Okay, so here are all these friends of the court briefs, and here's this case that goes up. And what did the Supreme Court do? To everybody's shock and amazement, the Supreme Court came down with a, a really landmark decision that was going to change the nature of science in the courtroom in the future. They said that there were some issues that should be ruled on by the trial judge in a gatekeeper capacity, saying that the trial judge would decide if the science was not good science, it shouldn't even go to the jury. Now you may say, how does that square with the jury system? It was a step away. They were saying that, can you get it out, turn it off? They were saying that in fact, judges should be the ones <laughs> Can you figure it out? <laughs> It'll go off. It'll go off. I hope so. Not for a long time. Um, basically what they were saying is the judges will be the ones to hear this initially. Now, that's a very interesting concept since most of you should know that judges like myself decided not to go to medical school but to go to law school, because guess what we didn't want to study? We really didn't want to take more science courses. Probably our last science course was either our freshman year in college or maybe even high school. And here we are, by some cruel trick of fate, being asked not only to study science, but to study cutting edge science. Because look at the science that was coming into the court. Now, we've already made the link between neuroscience and genetics. Imagine when the first DNA case came into the court system. I mean, now we know it's all the gold standard and everybody um, knows DNA testing is okay, but the first judge that looked at it, judges were spending hours and hours and hours um, looking at these things and writing 40, 50, 60 page opinions analyzing these things. And in fact, we can probably see that this is the way it's going to go with a lot of the neuroscience questions that are coming in. The issue of presenting this evidence to the court so that the judge would rule on it first, the Supreme Court came down and said that, and they gave some guidance. They said what the court should consider. All right, what should the court consider? Reliability, is this science you can rely on? Has it been tested? Does it follow the scientific method? Has it been published? Has it been peer reviewed? Has it been tested and has it been shown to come again and again that the experiments really bear this out over and over again? The things that probably everybody here who's worked in science would know as the scientific method. So that made a huge difference and what would happen would be that judges would do this and into this walked first genetics and now neuroscience. If the trial judge is given the responsibility of making this decision, the trial judge is the first one who is going to look at the new science as it comes in. So how do judges do this? How do we learn about science? I already told you, we don't take courses. We don't read journals. How do we learn? We learn through the lawyers putting these experts on. And we have to decide, are the experts giving us the straight scoop or not? Now, you should bear in mind that if a judge eliminates a plaintiff's expert and says, no, I don't think that science is reliable, and I don't think that testimony meets the scientific method, that person cannot testify before the jury. You see, this is a, a pre-trial hearing that takes place. And the decision says, yes, the question will go to the jury to hear two experts, or no plaintiffs, you're not gonna get to put on an expert. If plaintiffs don't put on an expert, the case is over. Because without expert testimony, they can't possibly win in a case that involves science and causality that depends on science. So these decisions are extremely important. Now, let me just turn to neuroscience, which is the cutting edge subject. Um, it has been met with skepticism by judges, and I think you just heard two speakers explain why. Um, unlike DNA, 
neuroscience is reaching the courts in a premature state. It's coming in before enough of the work. And when, by the time DNA evidence was introduced in the courtroom, there really was a consensus in the scientific community. There's no consensus. I mean, I was listening, I think it was Steve who said, um, there's a consensus um, with two different groups having, well, that's two different consensus, would the plural be consensus? I mean, you can't, there's no consensus when each group takes a different position. And the courts, the courts are sensitive enough to that. I can tell you that one of the reasons I'm here and they invite me is because as a judge, I do love the science. I find these cases fascinating. And I am willing to listen to the experts and do a lot of reading and try to figure out, um, is this really so? And I will say that the case that excluded the scientific evidence, the neuroscientific evidence, was perfectly right. There was a case where they allowed it, and that has been seriously criticized, and we'll see what happens on the appeal. But most of these cases are not getting to the jury. When you have a group called No Lie MRI, <laughs> somehow or other, that just doesn't have the ring <laughs> of real science that makes you want to say, oh, I guess the jury should hear this, you know. Um, it, it, it doesn't, it does, it isn't convincing. Where it will go, what will happen with it, nobody can tell. I assume that over a period of years, some of this may get to be more reliable. Right now, I do feel um, <clears throat> that it's in a premature state. The temptation, as, as Owen mentioned to you, the temptation of people to look for explanations about these classic questions of responsibility and causation and what made me do it, uh, it's, it's very, very tempting. But right now, there are really no answers. And let me just point out that some of the differences in all of this has to do with the way judges decide cases. We don't have the same time frame that scientists have. We can't wait around until the experiments finish, until there is a consensus in the scientific community. We have got to decide the case in front of us on the information as it is now. There are people waiting for a decision. I'll give you a perfect example um, in my own life. Um, I had a case it'll date me to tell you this, it involved the swine flu vaccine and whether the swine flu vaccine actually caused, the government conceded on something called Guillain-Barre, but there were some side effects like transverse myelitis and certain encephalopathies that, I, all these cases got put in front of me. And um, I heard a testimony from a neuropathologist, he was like outstanding in the field, and he was doing these experiments with monkeys. I listen, it was not a jury case. Cases against the government usually are court tried. I listened to him very, very carefully, and so help me, after a half an hour, I didn't understand a word he had said. I just knew that he had not answered the question. You know, the question was, <laughs> did it cause it or didn't it cause it? And I got all this stuff going on, which usually you get when somebody doesn't want to answer a question. So I finally turned to him and I said, doctor, I said, look, um, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think um, the vaccine caused this man's problems? And he said, Judge, I need about 10 years to finish my experiment. Can you ask me again in about 10 years? And I looked at him, and, and a light went on, and I realized what a difference there is in the way we are looking at truth. He is waiting for a truth that will come at the end of this experiment. I didn't want to say, you see that guy sitting over there, you know, in 10 years he may be dead. Um, I didn't, believe me, I didn't say that. Um, but, but the answer is we have to make our decisions in a snapshot of time. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. I can give you examples of, of, of each of those. But um, we'll never know on the swine flu because it never came back again. Nobody really finished... Um, and gave me an answer. Actually, I did run into the guy 10 years later. He said, do you want to know the end of my experiment? And I said, no, 
no. I've already decided those cases, and I don't know. I don't want to know if I was wrong. You know, I don't want to hear about that. Um, <coughs> the fact of the matter is, we would all love an easy answer to know whether a guy's going to reoffend, whether we should turn him loose um, on probation, whether um, what the intent was. You know, did the guy really? have an intent to do some, <laughs> let me tell you, somebody, the, he strangled his wife before he threw her out the window. So, you know, that doesn't exactly make you think the guy didn't know what he was doing. He was making, it was a belt and suspenders approach, let's put it that way. Um, I think that um, we'd like answers to these questions. They're the time, the questions, as, as was pointed out, that have been with us since Plato and Aristotle, and we'd love an easy answer. We'd love to know we were right. And there isn't a judge around who doesn't release somebody on probation and think, oh, you know, am I right? But what we rely on for predictability are the things like psychiatrist reports, interviews, um, psychiatric testing, things like that. We have never had anyone before tell us, no, no, no. You don't have to listen to that psychiatrist and that psychiatrist and figure which one's right. We're gonna give you a real answer because it's physiologic, it's in the brain, and this is determinative. It's not there yet. I'm not sure we're gonna buy it for a very, very long time. So thank you. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes. I, my urge is to sort of let them have at it at each other just a bit and have discussion. And then we'll, we'll give the audience a, a few minutes to ask questions. Uh, thank you for knowing how to use that microphone thing. Please make sure the little light is on green on the machine. Side, up, up. So uh, as everybody's plugging in, just one, one um, comment. I, probably this is a very sophisticated audience. Um, so when Judge Rothstein said uh, correctly that DNA evidence is certain and we, we, everyone is in agreement, that is the use of DNA to identify uh, somebody who was at the scene uh, because uh, we are all, unless you have an identical twin, uh, unique. Uh, the, the DNA issues that I was uh, casting uh, a certain amount of doubt on is saying that a particular flavor of a certain gene uh, is uh, involved in causing uh, a, a behavioral variation. So I think you probably all got that, but I th thought it was really important. I mean, one, one is just, is really, the only question with, DNA testing with identity is whether you've handled the samples right, right but right. not the science. Right. No, that's a good distinction yeah. because what you're talking about is not there yet. Right, it's not there. It's yet. not there yet. Yeah. What, we're, what we're comfortable with is the fact that usually if you, well, of course, you get into the whole question of testing labs and whether they're accurate or not. But once, let, let's assume for now that you had um, a good lab, then we are pretty much all willing to agree that DNA, we no longer ask for statistical proof that your DNA is unique. Yes, right. We, we, we passed we that point, it's accepted, um, takes the court a while to get there, but it's there. But as far as neurological, you know, neuroscience, no. nobody's there. Yeah. So I've got a quick question for Judge uh, Rothstein. I often get asked, uh, why don't the courts, because they do have the power to do this, why don't the courts more frequently appoint their own experts. And I would be interested in your uh, perspective on this, and in particular on whether or not there's any distinction that one might argue between the utility of doing so with neuroscientists as opposed to other kinds of experts. Uh, is, there, is there a thresholding there where we think the courts really are going to have their, need to have sometimes their own court-appointed experts in these complex cases? You've asked a question that really subsumes about three questions, okay? Um, As being efficient. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the rules, as you know, I know, the, the federal rules allow a court to hire an expert. Usually the parties split the cost, but um, to hire our own experts. There are problems with doing that. In fact, the AAAS tried to have a project where they would have um, sort of a stable, a list of experts to call in various, uh, on various subjects that would make it easy. There are problems with finding experts. First of all, and certainly in neuroscience this would be the case, where is a neutral expert in neuroscience? I mean, from what I heard today, you'd have to look long and hard to find somebody who is neutral. Um, and you need a neutral expert to help the court. Now, most of the time, what if I think the best function of a court-appointed expert, and I've used two of them, is a teaching expert. Not to give you an opinion on the case. That you shouldn't be doing. The, the, the parties should do that, and their experts should each put out one side. But a teaching expert, I had a case, a patent case, involving, um, I don't know if it's going to happen in my lifetime, but it would be um, using viruses to treat um, genetic defects. This happened? Oh, yeah. right. Well, this was, you know, so I had to learn all about vectors and viruses and how you could place, it was, it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And I said, look, before I hear from your experts, I want somebody to give me the basics in all of this so that I at least know the vocabulary that you guys are talking about. And it was great. This guy is the chair of you know, the department at the University of Washington. He came in and he gave me, he told me he gave me his graduate course by coming in two days a week. And the attorneys were there. They could hear what he was telling me. But that's different than using an expert to give you an opinion on the case. Judges will not do that. They will not give up their responsibility in making the decision about whether the science is good or not. They cannot delegate that to a scientist. And you can see why. I mean, who start thinking of who you would think of who would be neutral in this area. Right, people are devoted to their own research. Yeah. As you pointed out, yeah. the research, you know, they're suppressing some yeah, things. Yeah. They're trying yeah. To yeah. Right. So, uh, following up on that, if I, if I could, Steve, just wanted to ask you a question about uh, when parties are looking for experts. Uh, I imagine that a lot of neuroscientists don't want to get involved in the legal system at all, uh, which is a problem because maybe they are in the best position to really help resolve the issues, but they're uh, hesitant to have their, uh, their credentials and paternity called into question on the stand. Absolutely. Um, what, what could be done to smooth that process, if at all, to ensure that there's not more barrier than the bare minimum to getting the best people to give the best evidence uh, to the court? Well, in, in truth, I think what you're doing or what the Neuroethics Society is doing uh, initially with a very small number of interested people, too small a number, but hopefully it will grow, is to get uh, scientists and lawyers talking to each other. Your final cartoon uh, was, was exactly right. Scientists uh, are very tough on each other in lab meeting, but not quite in the, they're not quite prepared for uh, cross-examination in the courtroom. Uh, scientists are also used to, I mean, it was very much the story about the man who wanted 10 more years, um, you know, that's, we're all, uh, good scientists are all very careful about drawing premature conclusions, and often the people who are the most calm and certain and say, this is the spot that did it, you know, we, 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 uh, we would uh, shrink from uh, interacting with. Um, in general, scientists are not very good at uh, engaging uh, society, uh, not, not only the law, and it's something we, no, I think we have to, uh, it, we, as educators, uh, these are, there have to be more activities like this. We have to bring young scientists along. Um, you, you know, I, I think if nothing, uh, nothing uh, illustrates that more than, you know, in the current uh, funding situation with, um, with the budget deficit, you know, stretching out as far as the eye can see. 
um, young scientists being demoralized, but not necessarily having been equipped to explain to policymakers, even their local congressmen, why what they're doing is right. important. Let's, let me suggest, some of it is a go ahead. It's a vocabulary uh, question. The, um, scientists don't speak the language of lawyers yes, right. or politicians. Well, they don't speak the language even of lay people. I mean, I mean when a, a, I mean a English. scientist. You mean English. I mean, juries have a hard time. But of course, that's where lawyers and scientists can work very, very well together. Because lawyer, a good lawyer can get a scientist to explain the most complex idea to a jury. What I've uh, observed along these lines is that um, the real, uh, the real landmines in communication are not the ones that uh, are self-evidently terms of art. So if, if uh, Steve says, you know, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, somebody who's not a scientist recognizes, aha, this means something specific. And if you say res ipsa loquitur, uh, he says, well, that's not English either, and that's something specific. But to be in a conversation between lawyers and scientists in which commonly used words mean very, very different things in the two fields. I mean, just think about the word trial, for example. Yes. You know, you're thinking an experiment, yeah, and yeah, you're thinking, right? right? That's great. Uh, or the word significant, yeah. right? Scientists use significant in a very statistical way, and lawyers think, oh, that just means it's important, yeah. right? Or the word development, right? Yes. Development yes. across yes. human, the, the brain, and yes. development well, on law is just something important that happened. It's not right? surprising, maybe, that Alan Leshner is in his current position, because when I became an IMH director, and uh, two weeks later found myself testifying and meeting with con congressmen, um, you tried to explain it to me and warn me, but I you know, was uh, cognitively impenetrable and young at the time. <laughs> um, Which gene? I, yeah, I, <laughs> no, I, it really was shocking uh, when talking about policy issues, say, around mental illness and mental health and insurance, what a small fraction of the concern was related to the actual science and how much had to do with costs, moral hazards, unintended, con all kinds of things that we in the laboratory just never think about. Let me suggest, since this woman has been waiting patiently, no. go uh. ahead. <laughs> you ask your question, they get one more shot at each other and then we'll go recept. Please. Uh, I'm Turkan Gardiner from Pragmatica Corporation. I have a question to Judge Rothstein uh, about the prevalence of precedence in court decisions. Uh, when some years back I worked uh, and prepared some expert testimony, I uh, quoted as a statistician some recent research on testing. Uh, of course, that was with regard to groups and testing statistical significance. But uh, it had never appeared in case law. So uh, my comment was not accepted. Now, in What's this your case question, of neuroscience, uh, the whole science is new. And precedence, is there enough precedence to go into other cases for judging with regard to a specific case? OK. Um. I'm not sure I understand your question, but I'll try to give you <laughs> try to answer it anyway. Um, our, case, our legal system is based on precedent. Right. We look, and that's another difference uh, between the law and science. We look backwards. We look for a justification in a past case to help us decide this case. It's because the law is there to give certainty. It's because the law is there to be predictable to help people plan, plan their business decisions, plan their um, estate decisions, all the things. We need predictability, we need consistency, okay? Science, on the other hand, um, really knows no precedent. They're, they're, they're tearing ahead to knock down a whole new area of knowledge. They're moving as fast as they can to learn new things. The paces are entirely different. To change the law, is a huge step, huge step, because you don't want to change the law. The law doesn't want to be changed. Science, on the other hand, especially in this age, is advancing geometrically, whereas we creep along arithmetically. It's a very big difference. Science is just 
pardon the expression, it's terrassing along and it doesn't care. As long as they're making their exchanges and verifying things, they're looking for new frontiers all the time. Um, it's very hard for us to keep up because we are on such totally different time spectrum. Thank you. So I'm looking at my watch and the time. Uh, so one point, if I may, just get, so it's, I wouldn't want people to walk away thinking there is no neuroscience that is currently useful in the courts, because there are some things, some kinds of injuries, for example, yeah. that That's we know we what yeah. their consequence right. will be. Right. So what's the line? How do you know, how will we know when we know enough, when somebody comes in and says, so, so what I wrote down was no problem, a problem, or the problem in the brain. So right now, lots of people could bring you a problem in the brain and assert that it's giving you the, the, uh, the cause. How will we know when it's the problem leading to the, the event as opposed to a problem that just happens to be similar? Well, I, I think you fingered a really important issue, and I, I think that um, part of uh, assessing the utility of neuroscience in this context is starting small first. And so uh, starting with uh, contributions toward the causes rather than the causes. So for example, I think that often in this early era, the neuroscience, when it is uh, relevant and admissible and not overly prejudicial, <laughs> Uh, will be serving a buttressing function. So it's going to be essentially triangulating with other bits of information that we know and adding some additional weight that is not dispositive all by itself, but that adds to our confidence that all these things together look more like this party winning than that. So I, I, th I think of it as sort of an incremental contribution. It's another form of information. It's another form of evidence. It's not the form of evidence. So I agree, absolutely. It has to be convergence. And I think you show, you know, and again, there are cases when somebody has a finding and then there's a surgical intervention and the mental state changes. And then, you know, there, the Phineas Gage, there's actually, you know, uh, you can see some causality. But the fundamental problem, which, which is really uh, a problem also for, for developing new clinical treatments is, again, this inviolability of the human brain and the fact that we are really looking at it indirectly. And, you know, ethically we would have it no other way, but it, it really does make this uh, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean there's nothing, but it... it <laughs> I think, oh, I expect what will happen over time is that our instruments for understanding the workings of the brain are changing almost daily. Yes. And they're getting more and more sophisticated. And we're coming up with more and more tests that are revealing. And I yes. guess that's the future. That it? is the future. There's one other issue which is really, which we've kind of danced around, and uh, maybe these terms are uh, too technical, but scientists are interested in the internal validity of their experiments, right? Have they controlled every variable so that they've identified the one critical causal factor with certainty. Um, in the real world, we're worried about external validity. That is, um, let's take the case of No Lie MRI, that very reassuring company name, um, <laughs> or, or CFOS. Uh, um, so, so the underlying experiments for, for CFOS were, as I understand it, uh, University of Pennsylvania undergraduates were told to be deceptive with respect to where they put something or whether they've t taken something. And, uh, and that deception was, you, you know, their brains acted differently. They had to do a certain amount of work with the prefrontal cortex to suppress the truth. Uh, and these were very nice experiments with respect to internal validity. That is, you could tell the difference between when, when a student was um, lying, following orders to lie uh, and not. But, Applying that to you know, a feral criminal or an anxious person in the hands of the TSA, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't relate. And, and, and uh, right. it's so amazing how often 
the, people focus on the technology, but not on whether this elegant laboratory experiment has any application to the hurly burly real world. Or to the individual in the case. Or the and individual. Your point yeah. that you made that yeah. often you're studying uh, mm. even a yeah. thousand people. Yeah. What yeah. value does it have with, when trying to translate it to an individual? Well, I think we see the complexity of the issue. Um, thank you. That's great.